Good morning, Watermark. It is so good to see you. My name is Timothy Atika, and I am one of the teaching pastors here. I'm so glad that we get to spend time together looking at the Word of God this morning. I want to start just by sharing with you what I believe is one of, if not the greatest spiritual truth that anyone has ever shared with me. Uh, And so I hope you heard what I just said. I'm about to share with you what I believe has been the most helpful spiritual truth that has ever been shared with me. I was sitting several years ago at Rudy's Barbecue in Austin, and I was sitting across the table from an an older man named Doug Sherman who invested a lot of time into my life. And I will never forget how he just interrupted my extra moist brisket in that moment to share this truth with me. Here's what he said. I still remember it. He had no clue that when he said it, I would latch onto it and it would It would create a shift in my life that would last for well over a decade. Here's what he said. He said, T.A., you have to understand your view of God determines your response to God. That's it. That's the one truth that has been the most helpful spiritual truth that I've heard that has helped shape my relationship with Jesus over the last several years. Your view of God determines your response to God. And it just makes sense. That's how... That's how all relationships work. Your view of a person determines your response to a person. So just look at an engaged couple. I mean, that guy in that relationship, he will do anything for that girl. He will spend all of his money. He will watch the notebook. He will run an errand to get feminine hygiene products from the store. He will do it because he is so enamored with his bride. But... Just go be fly on the wall in a marriage counselor's office. And what are you going to hear? You're going you're to hear story after story of small view of a person after small view, which is driving small response after small response. See, your view of a person determines your response to that person, and the same is true with God. That's why if you wake up tomorrow morning and you feel too busy for God, or you're, if it feels like, Only work and determination and discipline for you to open up your Bible and go through the motions and check it off your list. The reason why it is like that is because of your view of God in that moment. You're having a small response because you have a small view. In that moment, at least in that moment, God is too irrelevant or too incompetent or too unenjoyable for you to actually enjoy connecting with him. But our problem is, do you know what our problem is? Our problem is, is we only try and address the response without ever addressing our view. So we wonder why we feel spiritually dry or spiritually inconsistent. And so what do we do? We try and muscle intimacy with God by making more commitments. Well, you know what? I'll just commit to getting up earlier and I'll commit to reading more and I will try to pray longer and I will try to sin Less. What are we doing? We're just addressing the response. And then we wonder why we make these commitments and then we don't keep them. It's because we are trying to have a big response to God with a small view of God. Change your view and I promise you, you will change your response. Let me illustrate it this way. You're Your view of God is like a balloon, and I am going to attempt to inflate this balloon on stage. I say attempt just because, I don't know if you ever feel it, like you ever go to blow up a balloon and you think, like what if I've forgotten how to do it? Like what if I just, you ever have that where it's like, I don't know if I can do this. So I'm just going to attempt to do it, and I'll just preface by saying, this is not going to change your life. Like, no one's going to be like, when T.A. blew up that balloon, that's when I met Jesus. Like, and ever since, (laughs) praise God for that balloon. No. But you need to know your view of God, it's like a balloon. So here we go. 
Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Let's pray and get out of here. I've done everything I came to do this morning. Hey, your view of God, it, it truly is like a balloon. Like it takes, at least for me, it takes focus and intentionality to inflate a balloon. And the same is true with your view of God. It takes focus and it absolutely takes intentionality. If you want to have a big response to God, you first have to have a big view of him. And so every single day, you have to put new air into your view of God in order to live with an inflated view of him. But what we want to do is we want to take our view of God, which gets inflated on a Sunday morning, and we want to tie it off, and we want to live off of oxygen from Sunday morning all throughout the rest of the week. But what happens when you tie a balloon off and just let it sit? It naturally deflates. And you add to the mix that you have an enemy who hates you. And he is consistently lying to you about God. Satan doesn't need you to believe that God doesn't exist. He just needs you to believe that God isn't worth it. Because if he gets you to believe that, you know what he does is he just whispers lies to you. What happens to your view? It just deflates. And so I just wonder how many of us this morning have showed up to church and our view of God is just like this. And we look around and we see people raising their hands that they're really into it. And we're like, why isn't that me? They have a big response because they have a big view. Change your view and you'll change your response. And so this morning, my sole goal is to put new oxygen, new air into your view of God. If I'm going to turn anywhere in the Bible to do that, I might as well just turn to the first page, to the first words of the Bible. This morning, we're starting a new series and we're, we're going to be spending several weeks just in Genesis chapters 1 through 3. You can't understand the Bible if you don't understand the first three chapters of the Bible. The series is called Made. So over the next several weeks, we're going to identify what we have been made to do. And so we're just starting acknowledging that we have been made to worship God. We have been made to worship Him. But if we want to step in the purpose for which we have been made, which is to worship Him, we have to fight for a big view of Him in order to have a big response to Him. The reason I want to look at Genesis chapter 1 is because Genesis chapter 1 was written to a group of people in order to inflate their views of God. If you're new to the Bible, Genesis was written to the nation of Israel who had been in slavery to Egypt for about 400 years. And in Egypt, there were over 2,000 different deities. And so when God, through Moses, brings the nation of Israel out of Egypt after 400 years of ca captivity, and he begins to lead them to the promised land, he gives them Genesis to clarify who he is. Because when the nation of Israel came out of Egypt, they were clear on one thing about their God. They, are, they were clear that their God is rescuer. But the question now is, who else is our God? Like here we are, we're wandering through the wilderness. We get hungry each day. We need water. We need protection. We need direction. Is our God able to do all those things for us? And so God gives Genesis through Moses to the people of Israel to clarify who their God is. And so with that in mind, listen to the first two verses of Genesis. God through Moses says this to the nation of Israel. He says, in, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So the nation of Israel comes out of Egypt, and they're clear that our God is rescuer. And God speaks to them through Moses and says, that same God that rescued you is the same God that created the cosmos. That's your God. Talk about a cosmic-sized breath of air into the balloons 
of each Israelite's view of God. And as their view of God would have been inflated as they read Genesis chapter 1, hopefully ours will be as well. That's the goal of this morning. It's just to put new oxygen into your view of God because your view of God will determine your response to God. So if you have a Bible, make sure that you join me in Genesis chapter 1 because what we're going to do is we're just going to move through the, through the first two verses. That's all we have time for this morning. Two verses. And we're just going to walk word by word, phrase by phrase. And we're going to unpack who our God is truly is. Genesis chapter 1, it starts and it says what? In the beginning, God. God is the first subject that shows up in the Bible. God, the word God shows up 32 times in 31 verses in chapter 1. So Genesis chapter 1, it's all about God. Some people misunderstand the point and purpose of the Bible. Some people don't want to have much to do with this book because they just believe that it's a book of rules, that it is somehow an instruction manual from God to us. But before this is an instruction manual, it is first and foremost a worship manual. This book exists to tell us who God is, what he's done, what he is doing, and what he will do. So anytime you read this book just to figure out what you're supposed to do, you've missed it. We come to this book to realize who God is, what he's done, what he is doing, and what he will do. And before we get back to to the first verse, I think it's just good to point out a disconnect I just shared with you why Genesis chapter 1 exists. It exists because God was speaking to the nation of Israel that had just come out of a polytheistic society, and he was clarifying who the true God was. Our tendency is to bring the debates of today, and we impose them onto Genesis chapter 1. So when we come to Genesis chapter 1, the primary questions that we're looking to answer is, Is there a God, or did we come here just by time and chance? How long is a day? Is it seven days, 24 literal hours, or are they periods of time? How old is the earth? Is it thousands of years or billions of years? These are the questions that we tend to bring to Genesis chapter 1. Now, can the Bible speak to these questions? Absolutely. And these are good questions to ask and to answer. And we want to answer those questions. We have a whole ministry here called Great Questions where we can answer these questions. In a few weeks here on Sunday morning, we're going to talk about science and how it works together with the Bible. But it's good for us to understand these are not the primary questions that God is addressing in Genesis chapter 1. If he was, I think he would have devoted more than one chapter to it. But this was written to the nation of Israel to clarify who. Our tendency is to come to chapter 1 with uh, questions of how and when. Genesis 1 exists to answer who. And so we want to read Genesis chapter 1 through the lens of an ancient Israelite. God says, in the beginning, God through Moses, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Okay, what does this tell us? This speaks of an absolute, an absolute beginning, meaning there was nothing, and then God did something, and then there was something, okay? You guys remember Blockbuster Video? Like, that just dated myself, but just want to give a shout-out to the people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, 60s, and beyond. You remember Blockbuster Video? Uh, Be kind and what? Be kind and rewind. Like, do you remember rewinding that VHS cassette? Some of y'all never rewound before you took it back. You're like, it served its purpose. I've gotten what I needed. The next person can figure it out. But... Uh, you'd hit rewind and that ribbon would begin to roll on the tape. Do you remember just listening to the sound of that ribbon rewinding until it got to the beginning and boom, you would hear this loud stop. You had reached 
the, the beginning of the ribbon. I just want you to think, if somehow we hit the rewind button on all of history, in the ribbon of history, we're, begin, we're to begin to roll back and stop wherever that beginning point is, God was already there. And God wasn't just at the beginning of the ribbon of creation. He was the one outside of it who created it and pushed play on it. That's what Moses is telling us when he says, in the beginning, God. So what does this tell us? Let's inflate our views of God. At first, it tells us that our God is eternal. He's, he's eternal. God had no beginning and he has no end. He has always been and he will always be. He's eternal. And if he's eternal, that also means that he is he's self-sufficient. Have you ever thought about that? Like God is completely sufficient within himself for existence. Like he is not dependent upon anything. Long before all of all of creation existed, God existed. And he was fine without any of us or anything within the confines of the observable world. He doesn't need oxygen. He doesn't need food. He doesn't need um, nine months in a uterus. He doesn't need an umbilical cord. He doesn't need anything that we would need for life on this earth. He's completely self-sufficient. He didn't make us because he was lonely and incomplete without us. He made us out of an overflow of his completeness. He's self-sufficient. But also when it says in the beginning God, it just means that God is atemporal. It just means that he stands outside of time. He's unaffected by time. He sees the beginning of time and the end of time at the same time. Which is just really interesting to think about. Like, who God is reminds us of who we're not. Like, his identity should breed humility in us. Because when we think about time, we, we're enslaved to time. Like, our, our calendars run us. We are confined to a 24-hour day. We can only see the minute that we're in. We can't see tomorrow even if we want to. Which is why we stress out. Any control freaks in the room? Anyone stressed out right now? Few people are honest. Way to go. It's church, so you got to be really careful about honesty here. But anyway, um, just think about what stresses you out. Stress is the result of not being able to control the outcome. It's a lack of control over how things are going to be, how things are going to play out. You can't see how things are going to play out. Anyone ever stress out about how their kids are going to turn out? Anyone ever stress out about finances? Anyone ever stress out about what's going to happen at work? It's simply because you are locked in time. You can't see tomorrow. You can't see next week. You can't see the outcome. And yet God sees the beginning of time and the end of time at the same time. He sees how things are going to play out. And he doesn't just see it. He's in control of it. That's why Colossians 1.17 says, and he, referring to Jesus, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Like we find out in Genesis chapter 1, that God, our God, is a God who simply has to say the word, and it happens. He's atemporal. He's outside of time. He's not confined by it. He controls it, and we're safe in his hands. But not only that, in the beginning, God, it means that our God is transcendent. Our God is transcendent. So you have to understand that when Israelites would have heard these words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, you need to know that there were competing cosmologies of the day that had different accounts of creation. So, for example, in Egyptian cosmology, the nation that they came out of, in Egyptian cosmology, it's not that there was nothing, and then there was a big bang, and then there was something. No, in Egyptian cosmology, when you thought about pre-existence, it was just a dark, 
infinite expanse of directionless waters or a chaotic ocean. And from that chaotic ocean was a god named Atum that came out, and then Atum just began to self-reproduce. And so Atum had offspring, and from his offspring, there was the sun, and there was the sky, and there was moisture, and there were all these different gods, and the gods themselves were aspects of creation. Then there was Babylonian cosmology. Babylonian cosmology started in the same way. It's not that there was nothing, and then there was something. No, there was this primeval ocean. There was the the, the goddess of salt water, Tiamat, and then there was the god of sweet water, and the, those two gods kind of got together and had a baby. Like these waters begin to swirl together, and from those waters come, come gods. And the reason that that's so important for you to realize is that the account of creation that we read in Genesis chapter 1 it is a polemic. It is, it is railing against those other cosmologies. It's to say, you know what? Our God didn't um, emerge from creation, and our God is not equivalent with creation. Our God, before there was any aspect of creation, there was our God. Our God created, but he stands distinct from creation. He is transcendent above it. And so we just need to understand our God is, he truly is, he is transcendent. And we tried to hit on this last Sunday when we talked about the fact that our God is holy, holy, holy. He is transcendent. He is so different. He is so other than we know him to be. I'll put it this way. In case you're wondering, just to kill curiosity, I drive a 2015 Hyundai Sonata. Pretty sweet ride at this point. Um, Besides the, besides the massive crack in the windshield that goes all the way across. But it is a sports sedan. I use the word sport very loosely in this situation. But I feel like it's top of the line 2015 Hyundai Sonata. So just go with me on this. But let's just assume that us collectively and us individually on our best days, we are a top of the line 2015 Hyundai Sonata. Some of y'all are deeply offended right now, but again, just go with me here. Just imagine, on your best day, you pull, you pull together your best life. On your best day, you're that 2015 top-of-the-line Hyundai Sonata. So in our minds, what does that make God? Probably a Mercedes S-Class, right? Like, I mean, different level of luxury, different level of... Uh, intricacy? No, God's not a Mercedes S-Class. He's an Airbus 380 private jet that was designed by a Saudi prince that has a parking space for a Rolls Royce and a private concert hall in the sky and a prayer room that automatically turns towards Mecca no matter where it is in the sky. When we talk about God being transcendent, we are talking about God being so other than we could ever truly understand him to be. What's interesting is if you try and go and Google that Airbus 380 jet, there's no pictures of it because it never made it to production. So you can kind of, in a haze, think about what that could even be like, but there's no way to truly get your mind around that type of royalty. And God's the same way. When we talk about him being transcendent, He's the author of creation, and yet he stands distinct from it. He is different than we are, and yet that transcendent God condescended to us in the person of Jesus Christ. He entered his own creation. He took on flesh and became like us. He identified with us so that he could be a sacrifice for us on the cross. He took all of our sin upon himself. He died, he was buried, and he rose from the dead so that we could be made right with that holy and transcendent God. I remember years ago, I went as a volunteer leader uh, to a young life camp during the summer. And I remember standing with the area director and uh, it was pool time. And so there were literally hundreds 
of high school kids in the pool at the same time, literally hundreds. It was chaos. And I remember the the area director looking at the leaders that were just standing or sitting around the pool watching the high school students. And then I remember him acknowledging those people and then acknowledging the leaders that were in the pool with students. And here's what he said. He said, you see all the leaders that are sitting around the pool just watching? Those are chaperones. The people in the pool, those are leaders. The the people on the outside of the pool, they're there to just watch and see what people do that is wrong. The people in the pool are there to build relationship because they care about the heart. And see, God has not stood far off as a chaperone just watching for us to fail. No, he's moved in close. He's drawn near in relationship because he cares about the heart. And he's come to draw us back to him. Yet he's transcendent. In the beginning, God, in the next word, is created. In the beginning, God created. That's the Hebrew word bara. In And in the Bible, that verb is only used of God's activity. And when it's used, it never speaks of the material that is used to create. And so while this one verb cannot carry the weight of proving that God created ex nihilo out of nothing, when you read the rest of Scripture, that's how God created He created out of nothing. Hebrews 11.3 puts it this way. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. God spoke and it appeared. And that just reminds us that our God is uniquely creative. Our God is uniquely creative. He is the only one who's created something out of nothing. Everyone else in creation has created something out of something. God is the only one who is truly original because he's the only one in all of history whose only inspiration has been himself. Everyone else has been able to look around and and find inspiration from something else, and yet God's only inspiration was himself. He's, he's uniquely creative and praise God for his creativity. I mean, just think about God's goodness displayed in creation. Like think about the fact that we have something called color. I, I do this with my kids. I'm like, what if God just made everything brown? Like everything, everything, all the trees, all the grass. You're like, you're describing Texas right now. But anyway, uh, just imagine if, if everything in all of creation, all of our food, all of our food was brown or gray or blue. You just pick one color. What if everything was only one color? What would that be like? Or what about this? Like, imagine all the different kinds of laughs just represented in this room. God's the one who thought up laughter. I wonder what God's laugh is like. Have you ever thought about that? He has to have the best laugh in the world. He created laughter, and he gave everyone a unique laugh because he's got the best sense of humor. God created us with five senses so we can taste things like creamy jalapeno ranch from Chewy's or Bluebell Two Step. Some of y'all with long COVID are like, too soon, man. Like, you still can't taste, so sorry about that. I think about temperature change. You know, like the fact that when it dips below 70, hits like 68, 69, everyone pulls out their solo stoves and puts on their Patagonia fleece vest. It's like, ooh, it's so cold. It's really not, but it's mental, and we're just grateful for that change so it doesn't feel like standing in front of a blowtorch for that one (laughs) day. Or just the fact that there's 440 different species of just sharks Sharks alone are so captivating that we can watch them for an entire week in July. (laughs) Like that is, all of that is an overflow of God's unique creativity. And you need to know that your life 
has been planned and mapped out by this God. Like your life is an overflow of his unique creativity. So why would you ever insist on doing things your own way? I believe that our lives only become mediocre when we insist on doing things apart from God because God is incapable of a mediocre existence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Heaven and earth, it's a reference to the totality of the universe. Someone deserves credit for the universe That credit goes to God, and how amazing that that same God, the one who created the universe, is the one that you're talking to when you pray. That's the one that is speaking to you when you open up the Bible. That's the one that is here to meet with us every Sunday morning. Is that the God that you're connecting with? If not, you've got the wrong God. Verse 2. We're just moving at lightning speed through the book of Genesis, chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And so here's what you need to understand. Verse 1 in Genesis, it's a summary statement of the rest of the chapter. It's a summary statement, so don't take verse 1 and verse 2 in chronological order. Verse 1 is a summary statement, and then verse 2 kind of backs us up into verse 1, and where Moses starts us is with just the the preconditioned state. And so we struggle that we don't get some of the answers that we want from verse 2, but where Moses starts, it's interesting where where the account of creation starts because it, it really coincides with the other ancient cosmologies of the day. Because as I told you, um, the Babylonian cosmology, the Egyptian cosmology, where did they start? They started with the chaotic waters. And so what do we see? We see that, that creation, it says that it is formless. That's the Hebrew word tohu. And it's void. That's the Hebrew word bohu. So creation was tohu bohu. You can just go to lunch and be like tohu bohu. Yeah, we, we get it. Formless and void. Okay? The fact that it was formless, it, it just means that there was no structure or order to it. It was chaotic. It was void, meaning it was, it was empty. It was unproductive. It was, it was uninhabited. One commentator described it as wild in waste. The earth is a place not producing life. It says darkness was over the deep. Okay, darkness just means that that God's light, his life-giving presence had not activated in the space yet. Darkness was over the deep. The the earth was a, a dark abyss. This is a reference to the cosmic waters of chaos. So the pre creation state is a dark, watery wasteland. There's no order, no life. And that is very similar to how the other cosmologies began. But what's the difference? What does it say? It says, in the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The waters is synonymous with the deep. When darkness is over the deep, it's wild and waste. And yet when the spirit is hovering over the waters, the picture there of hovering, it's like fluttering. It is, it is an eagle um, moving over the waters. The, that word in the Hebrew, it, it, it implies movement. And so as God's spirit begins to move, this wild and waste land now has potential in possibility. And so what does it tell us about our God? It tells us that our God is near. Because in the midst of the wild and waste, the Spirit of God, what do we see? We see the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. The Spirit of God is not the waters, but He is close to them. And His presence brings possibility and potential, which is amazing because that same Spirit is the Spirit that has brought you to life if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. The reason that you know God is because the Spirit of God hovered over your heart. 
and began to convict you, and he allowed you to see the truth of God. He awakened you to the beauty of the gospel. And now the wild and waste of your soul has been brought to life in order because of that same spirit. And it also tells us that our God is, is Lord. Our God is Lord. He is ruling and he is reigning over all creation. What did we see? We saw that it, the land in the deep abyss, it was formless and void. So what does God do? He speaks and what's the result? In days one through three of creation, which we will see later, he forms. And then in days four through six, what does he do? He fills. And it all comes simply through him speaking. This is different from the ancient cosmologies of the day because the most popular one at the time would have been the Babylonian cosmology. And in Babylonian cosmology, there was this epic battle between Tiamat, the saltwater goddess, and uh, Marduk, who was this warrior god that rose up to war against Tiamat. And Tiamat, the saltwater goddess, kind of becomes this, this dragon. And this dragon, in ancient cosmology, assembles this, this army. And so what Marduk does, this this warrior God rises up and draws the sea dragon to him. He brings Tiamat in close. So close that Tiamat opens her mouth to swallow Marduk. And just as Tiamat opens her mouth, Marduk summons winds from the corners of the earth and blows the wind down uh, Tiamat's throat. It opens up her esophagus, and then Marduk shoots an arrow down her throat into her heart. And then Marduk takes Tiamat, rips her body in two, and with her body creates the heavens above and the land beneath. That's how the, the heavens and the earth were created in Babylonian cosmology, through an epic battle. Yet in Genesis chapter 1, God has no rival. He speaks in all of creation, submits to the word of his mouth because he's the one who rules. He's the one who reigns. Our God is Lord. This is our God. Like, let's just leave here with a bigger view of God. Our God is eternal. He's self-sufficient. He's atemporal. He's transcendent. He's uniquely creative. He's He's near. He is, he's Lord. Is that the God that you are responding to or not? So what do we do with Genesis chapters, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2? What do we do with that? How do we respond? Well, I just want to, I want to encourage you to answer two questions this morning in response to what we've just read. Here's the first question. The first question is, have you been created by God or has God been created by you? Like, which God are you responding to? Are you responding to a God that has created you or are you responding to a God that you yourself have created? I'm telling you, if you wake up tomorrow and have little to no desire to meet with God, if meeting with God just feels like duty and discipline, you are responding to a God that has been created by you. The God that we want to respond to is the same God that spoke into Job's life. And what did God say to Job? He says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? You know what the right response is to that question? Nowhere. Where were you? Where was I? We were nowhere. And so John the Baptist's words feel really fitting in this moment. He must increase, I must decrease. Tomorrow when you wake up, he must increase. You gotta put new oxygen into the balloon of your view of God. He must increase in your life. We must decrease. There's only one God and we are not him. He doesn't exist for us. We exist for him. And so here's what I want to encourage you to do is you respond to that question. Before you leave today, worship him for who the scriptures declare he is instead of who you have decided that he is. And then when you get home or you go to lunch, share with a friend or a family member 
one way that your view of God was inflated today. And then every day this week, fight for the biggest view of God possible. Put new oxygen into your view of God every single day. Worship him and then respond to him throughout the day. So the first question is, have you been created by God or has God been created by by you? And then the second question I want you to answer is this. Is God Lord of your life? Is he Lord? We read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. God is sovereign. He is king. He's a God who just speaks and the impossible happens. Does his word have that type of authority in your life? That when he speaks, you respond? Because that's the place that he deserves. God will never just settle for being your savior when he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Kings reign. Is he reigning in your life? So my encouragement to you is before you leave, surrender to him. When, before you leave, just open up your hands to him and just say, you get to rule, you get to reign. I exist for you. You don't exist for me. And then I'll just close by saying this. Some of you hear this and you came in this morning without a real relationship with God. And I'm so glad you're here. But for you, maybe where it starts is realizing that your soul is chaotic, just like the, the, the deep waters before the Spirit of God began to work and move. Your soul is chaotic. And yet God has moved in near to us And he brings peace and order to the chaos of our lives. Maybe your life is chaotic because you have been looking everywhere for satisfaction. You've tried work. You've tried success. You've tried money. You've tried romantic love. You've tried sex. You've tried all these different things, looking for life, looking for satisfaction. You're on this chaotic search for meaning and satisfaction. And yet Jesus Christ is moving in near to you this morning, and he wants to bring order to your chaos. He is introducing himself to you this morning, saying, I want to be your savior, and I want to be your king. Blaise Pascal, friends, French mathematician, he says, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the creator made known through Jesus Christ. If that's you, before you leave today, would you do business with him? Would you surrender to him? Your view of God will determine your response to him. May we be people this week that fight for the biggest view possible because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would just have your way in this place today that we would be men and women that recognize exactly who you are, that you are the Lord of all creation, that you are the one who spoke and everything appeared. God, just as you rule over creation, just as creation has responded to your authoritative voice, May we open up our lives and allow you to speak in right now. And as you speak, may we respond because you're worthy of our lives. God, would you adjust our view of you wherever we're believing lies? May we see the truth and may we respond because you're worthy. And may our worship be more authentic because we worship you out of a heart that has seen you for who you truly are. We need you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.